Thank you very much for showing up early morning. Alrighty, so my name is Ashkan Karbis Frushan. You can call me Ash. I've been called worse. Um, started Watch Mojo 13 years ago with a vision to inform and entertain with a video on every topic. But who am I kidding? We're known for top 10 lists. We did not obviously invent the format. Before us, you had Wayne's World, Letterman, and the OG of top 10 lists, Moses and the Ten Commandments. This is a format that you know, as humans, we've always been drawn to. And I would say today, we basically are here to serve fans of popular franchises. So 2006, we launched around the same time as YouTube did. Most of the videos that were becoming popular online were UGC, user-generated content. And for us, it made no sense to try to kill Hollywood. That wasn't gonna happen. And while user-generated content was changing publishing, news gathering, and was revolutionary in many ways, it didn't seem to be the sandbox that I felt we should compete in. And so we focused between Super Premium and UGC in the premium space, and over time, you also had this new breed of creators, the prosumers, basically the influencers and the creators that have basically arrived on the scene. So when we think of the internet, there's always the three Cs. If we're talking about YouTube, you could argue there's some commercial applications to YouTube, but YouTube isn't just the content platform. YouTube really nailed the community part of it as well through you know, topics that you might be interested in. When I started the business, distribution looked very different, right? You had AOL, Yahoo, MSN. If you wanted to reach an audience, you basically had to find a way to get your content on those three portals. Today, it's obviously changed. YouTube, Facebook, Google, Netflix. I've been covering this quite a while. We used to email Steve at YouTube, and he used to answer the emails himself. That's how far back it was. But I was always very bullish on YouTube. A few days or weeks before Google bought YouTube, I wrote an article saying YouTube is wildly profitable. No doubts about it. I mean, I was kind of guessing. The idea was that you know, if, if YouTube wanted to flip the switch and start making money, it could. And always thought that YouTube was the top place for content creators to embrace. Now, Warren Buffett says you never know who's swimming naked till the tide goes down. I used to say, yeah, sure, the economics may suck on YouTube, but if the audience is there, over time the economics will catch up. And when you look at the evolution of video, I mean, pre-2000, you had the real player, and then you had still the portals leading the way. Some of you may even remember eBombs World before YouTube kind of took over. And YouTube had a lot of other competitors like Rever, Gooba, Dailymotion, and Meta Cafe, but ultimately YouTube trounced all of those. Today we kind of think of YouTube and Netflix as the two leading players in the video distribution space. And when you look at content creators, so in my third book, which is really about the evolution of digital media and YouTube, it's through the eyes of you know, an entrepreneur who built Watch Mojo, I kind of looked at the different waves of content producers and so the first wave of content producers in digital was the pop.coms and the pseudos. It was way too early, no broadband, consumers were not watching videos. The second wave was post.com bubble bursting, and you had mania and heavy TV. And these were the ones that I looked at and said, hmm, there's a little bit of a revolution going on here. And I put Watch Mojo in this third wave of content producers, and our contemporaries were Jim Lauderbacks for Vision 3 and Next New Networks, which YouTube eventually acquired. And we were very naive into thinking that we were gonna build these own and operated websites, but we realized very quickly that we had to pivot and embrace distribution over building our own destination. The fourth wave, I call them the reluctance, the vivos. Didn't like YouTube, didn't wanna be on YouTube, they had to be on YouTube. The fifth one were companies like Awesomeness TV that just said, screw a website, we're just gonna go build on YouTube. And the sixth one is like the empire strikes back. Traditional media that woke up and said, oh my God, we're late to the party, how do we catch up? What marked the return of digital video, to me anyway, was Live 8, an event, you know, like basically Live 8, but redone in 2005. I was like, wow, first of all, AOL is still around, and two, online video is a thing. I was blown away, and that's when, as an executive entrepreneur, my entrepreneurial eyes opened, and I said, let's basically dive in and create a catalog. Now, what's ironic about the Live 8 uh, thing was that live has not actually really succeeded as much as other formats of content based on category, style, format, and genre, which to me are the four levers you play with to carve out your niche. So 
We're not going to get into, for uh, reasons of just time, why Google became this dominant beast of a company. Ultimately, I, t I really boil it down to timing, which simplifies it. Um, but Google then had the foresight to buy YouTube. And I think that YouTube is even more dominant in video than Google is in search. And that says a lot, since to Google means to search. So there was a lot of things simple, like embedding a video on a website. It was genius. Once you could embed it, which we take for granted, but once you embed a video on any website, boom, there goes your distribution strategy. You don't have a choice anymore. And it's ironic that you know, we watch Mojo obviously have become experts at copyright and fair use, but ironically, YouTube itself, its roots are in piracy. And they mastered the Digital Millennium Copyright Acts for safe harbors. And they've, because of that kind of wretched past, they find themselves caught between a rock and a hard place, essentially trying to appease the creators and the remash culture, the mashup culture, with these rights holders that view YouTube as a frenemy. Right? So as an entrepreneur, it's frustrating that sometimes YouTube tilts the playing field towards rights holders, but I get it. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. And we're going to touch on a few of these things in the slides to come. One thing that frustrates me is when people say, YouTube is all about the influencers, or YouTube is all about gaming. No, 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 no. To you, YouTube is about this or that. YouTube is everything. YouTube has replaced network TV. It has replaced cable TV. It has replaced the magazine, the water cooler, everything, right? So to me, I was never into like the influencers and the creators. I used to listen to music on YouTube. And eventually I said, hey, we've gone from pirated content to UGC, the vloggers, the do-it-yourselfers, the music. And I kind of eventually said, you know what I really like more than anything else is coming up with lists. And so we kind of became one of the leaders in that format. And then obviously the Let's Play Gaming community, the unboxing, the kids, which now is giving YouTube headaches. To put it mildly. And to me, YouTube was always like the Statue of Liberty. We'll take your unpopular, your uncool, your insulted, your, you know, stigmatized. And I think that's one of the reasons why the LGBTQ community was able to press record, open up, because at school they were being abused. They were being intimidated. So YouTube, whether it wanted to or not, again, ironically, given what's happened of late, kind of became the flag, you know, the torchbearer for the LGBT community. And it puts it in this awkward position where it might have certain responsibilities or want to do things that then, as an open platform, it struggles with, right? YouTube actually has good intentions, right? Unlike some companies. And then, briefly, also, you have to kind of tip your hat to India. India has basically taken over YouTube. Why? Because YouTube fundamentally was this awesome platform that allowed you to take your so-called weaknesses and threats and turn them into strengths. So if people say, hey, in India, it's a huge market, but individually people's discretionary income is low, well, guess what's better than free entertainment? So everybody embraces YouTube, especially on their mobile. And then one of the reasons why we really succeeded, because we are based in Montreal, where it's a relatively affordable city, right? Guess what's also very affordable and low cost? India. Right? So again, YouTube is this other playbook. It's this just different thing that traditional media has never been able to wrap its head around. We're all hypocrites. <laughs> all of us. So advertisers like what? They like quality programming, brand safe, but they want the reach. Right? But if I tell them, hey, guess what? We're going to have this great show where innocent kids are killed, and there's sex amongst siblings, Game of Thrones, advertisers are obviously not going to want to embrace that, hence why it's on HBO, for example. But they still want that. They want brand safe, popular shows, which is kind of almost an oxymoron. Human beings, we like things that are bad. Wine is grapes gone bad. Cheese is, you know, same thinking. And we like things like sports and sex and violence, and that's what we spend a lot of time engaging content. Things like, I'm just making a fondue, I need the recipe, it's in and out. You spend five seconds on that. And so, as a publisher, you're drawn to serve audiences' appetite for sex and violence. And then on YouTube, which is a massive platform meant to scale, 
trading off confidence level and margin of error, well, those things are not brand safe, right? So I get why we're not going to have sexy singers or crazy violent killers in movies. I can live without that. But then when on YouTube all of a sudden they say, hey, you can also have the rise of Adolf Hitler, which is to me a history video because that triggers certain keywords, there's a part of me that goes, yeah, I didn't sign up for this. You know, I have a responsibility to my employees, so we need to produce brand safe content. But if all of a sudden we're rewriting history where Adolf Hitler did not exist, yeah, you know what? I'm not sure that is in my company's mission to inform and entertain or Google's mission to you know, readily make content available, et cetera, et cetera. And these are things that as a society we have to start asking ourselves, what do we, like, what is the priority? I don't have the answer. And then distributors are also hypocrites because you go on their main page and it's all very safe and pristine content, but if you look at their log files, what gets searched and read and viewed is the sex and sports and violence, right? In the middle area of those three circles is the opportunity in publishing. The, bigger, the biggest shifts really have come, however, in how we consume content. We've gone from serving up content on an owned and operated website. At my old company, we reached 5 million readers. We thought we were huge. Today, Watch Mojo reaches 125 million users a month. That's not humble brag. That's a testament to YouTube. Like, YouTube is insanely huge with 2 billion users. And then the other one is having gone from search to social. We don't just go to Google and search. We actually find things through Twitter and Facebook. And so the way we succeeded is we actually gave a voice to our audience. We gave them the suggest tool where they could go and say, do top 10 Queen songs. And then they would vote for Bohemian Rhapsody or whatever. And that created a connection between us, the content we produce, and the audience. And ultimately, YouTube is perfect because then you go into the comments and you call somebody the B word because, you know, they disagreed with your pick for top 10 Queen songs, right? But that kind of... Those three things basically explain our success and why YouTube has been so revolutionary. Netflix, awesome company, changed so much. To me, pretty evolutionary. It's taking content we watch on TV and content we watch in theaters, and it just makes it convenient in your house. Evolutionary. YouTube has changed the definition of quality, the definition of what is a celebrity, how people become celebrity. And that's partly also what's making it replace television as the leading consumption platform. And you keep hearing about how advertising is changing and the death of the 30-second ad spot. I don't think advertising is going anywhere. But what is critical and what has been really, really disruptive was the introduction of TrueView. That skip ad is the most important thing in media, I would say, pretty much over the last 50, 60 years. Because all of a sudden, you do not just need to create content that is engaging, but your advertising has to be engaging. And YouTube has tried, unlike other companies, to actually fund content. But it realized that it made no real sense to go out and give Reuters money to produce content because the audience has taken over and there's a democratic method to the madness that has zero correlation between the cost of the content production and how popular it's going to be. Another major shift has been mobile. So for a decade, people used to come to us and ask us, do you want us to build you an app for mobile? I was like, we already have one. They're like, where is it? I'm like, it's YouTube. YouTube's the app. Same thing with connected TVs. And mobile has changed everything. To quote Seinfeld, why would I put a show on a big, heavy rectangle in your house when I could put it in your pocket? There's always a Seinfeld reference in any presentation I make. And so the challenge now is there's all this clutter, right? There's 500 hours of content that are being uploaded every day to every minute to YouTube. And again, why storytelling becomes more important, not just for content and editorial, but also for ads and also for corporate. To quote Steve Jobs, the most powerful person in the world is a storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation that is to come. Hollywood is a hits-driven business, and it can't wrap its head around YouTube. We've had conversations with the biggest media companies every year. The same problems they had 10 years ago, they still have today. They're trying. Some of them do it through interesting ways. I think Viacom buying VidCon was brilliant. It missed out on the biggest virtual stage, YouTube. So it went out and bought this awesome physical stage. Brilliant, brilliant transaction. 
And YouTube has kind of tried to hold people's hands and go from hits and basically, you know, views, which could be clickbaity, to watch time. We didn't game our editorial for watch time. It was just a no-brainer. It's a top 10 list. You're going to talk about an entry for about a minute. There's a 10-minute video. People want to watch the end. Boom. Luck and timing. Don't want to pretend it was that much foresight. But it really, really helped us. And the other thing is that with YouTube, unlike Facebook, where the, the traffic is so hit or miss and serendipity, you can actually take your subscribers and turn them into fans. Give a lot of credit to Rooster Teeth, one of the most successful companies at going not just off YouTube, but basically building out a diversified media company. <clears throat> so YouTube, I think, is in this dominant position. Their lead is unsurmountable. This is brand equity amongst young audiences. YouTube's number one, Google's number two, and these are all brands. But you'll see the top five or six, actually even seven of the top 13, are media brands. Kind of explains why all of a sudden Walmart wants to be in the media business. So people always ask me about YouTube and Facebook. It's very different, right? I mean, YouTube, it's a, it's a video business, so it's going to fight till the death and try to build on their lead. Video is like 5% of Facebook's business. And YouTube, being part of Google, partnering and sharing revenue and sending traffic out is part of their DNA. Mark Zuckerberg has zero incentive to make sure you are happy and successful in the content industry. Because he built a system, which is genius, that people pay him for traffic, right? So people are always looking for like a quick overnight success. And I tell them, look, things that scale aren't usually sustainable. And then things that are sustainable don't scale quickly, right? So if you want to compete on YouTube, I ask you, do you have two, three years? What's your realistic timeline to build presence? And so YouTube obviously is going to have going forward, even more risks. It's a global platform, so it likes to have systems that are global. It doesn't like to say, we're going to have this set of rules in Europe and this other set of rules in North America, right? So I'm Canadian. Um, America's great. No country is perfect. But Americans love their you know, First Amendment, which is great. But in Europe, they had the Holocaust, right? So they're like, no, no, no. If you're denying the Holocaust, that's not freedom of speech. That's hate mongering or whatever, hate speech. So now Google came out and surprisingly said, OK, going forward, if you deny the Holocaust, then we're going to take down your content. That's a hugely important shift in YouTube's thinking imposed by it by the EU, right? So going forward, Google is going to have this kind of soul searching. There's no legal difference between being a platform and a publisher, right? But the Bay Area has kind of forever ran with this concept that, well, no, we're not responsible for content that is put on our platform. And I think going forward, we're at a very quick pace seeing that that will probably change, right? And it's not voluntary. They're being forced. Content ID, I literally wrote a book about it. I had hair like Fabio when I started the business. Content ID is frustrating. And I don't like the fact that YouTube doesn't totally reflect copyright law and its, its corporate policies, which shift a little bit to the rights holders, but it's their freaking platform. But so when it comes to content ID, you're going to see it like battleground going on and on, especially with what's happening in the EU. Kids, it's plausible that YouTube just gets out of the kids space at some point, remains to be seen. But so there's a lot of challenges. But the thing that I, I kind of want to close off on is we can't be hypocrites where it's like we love YouTube because it's this open platform that allows anything to happen. It allows an entrepreneur from Montreal to build this global business. But then we don't like the bad that comes from it, right? If it wasn't for YouTube, I'd be maybe, maybe still in business running a company of five people. So if I love the fact that YouTube is this awesome platform with tremendous scale that's allowed us to get to 50, 60, 70 employees, never raise venture capital, and it's doing, you know, doing well, then I got to take the good that comes with the bad. And that applies to marketers and publishers and users who may not like everything that is published on YouTube, but that's, that comes with the territory of it being an open platform. Cool. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the show.